gosh, I gotta turn it up. Keats here. Keith Gomez. Good to see him. I want to welcome that one person, the only lone person online right now. Hmm. Want to say hi to Tim? What's that? <laughs> Send that to me, bro. <laughs> no, I want to see it, though. Oh my god, okay, look you guys. Tim, come up here real quick. So look what Tim brought, blessings from heaven. Homemade banana nut bread. Mm. If you guys were here, instead of being in the bunny slippers, right? It's my offering for the week for Tim. <laughs> the offering table. I lay it at his feet. <laughs> <laughs> but Tim, seriously, send that to me, bro. Seriously, guys, I don't know what you said. <laughs> hey, Louie, what's up, Louie? Rick, Ramito, good morning, brother. God bless you. Good to see you guys online. Jeff Hatfield. That's where Jeff sits. I like that. Both of you guys. Mike Gatto, hey Mike, good to see you brother, God bless you, long time no see, it's been a few days. All right, you guys, good morning, good morning Christian, how you doing? Good morning everybody, let's take our seats, we're going to uh, get into prayer, and uh, it's good to see everybody here this morning, and want to welcome those who are joining us online, got our uh, good friend of mine, Mike, that I haven't seen in quite a while, is joining us online, Noah, uh, I think I saw Rick, Rodney. Rodney, can, I, I know place, two places that, people that can be at two places at one time. Rodney's here and I see him online. Thanks, Rodney. A uh, couple of prayer requests, you guys. I think I've seen Carlos Marquez here. His mom passed away on Saturday, you guys, and I want to keep Carlos in, your, in our prayers. It, it's difficult when we lose a parent or a mom, and so our condolences, Carlos, to you, and I want to lift you up in prayer and, and pray for him and the family during this time as arrangements have to be made in the business side of things that's the difficult part of it. and so uh keep carlos in prayer you know you guys why don't we just have carlos come on up we're gonna lay hands on you carlos and and pray with you let's surround carlos you guys Amazing to know that your mom is able to see your life now as a man of God. And uh, I know this hurts, man. This is one of the things I know that hurts so much, bro. But we know that God's peace passes all understanding. So let's, let's pray for Brother Carlos. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we lift up Brother Carlos before you, Lord. Lord, losing a mom is no joke, Lord. And, and Lord, you know what loss is. And we ask for your comfort and peace upon Carlos, Lord. And, and Lord, I pray that your spirit would pour upon him, Lord, and that you'd give him a peace. And we're thankful that she's in your arms. It doesn't change the fact that we're still brokenhearted and here, Lord, and trying to pick up the broken pieces. So, Lord, we, we lift up Carlos and his family to you, Lord. We ask that your peace and love and your comfort be upon the entire family, Lord. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for Brother Carlos and for what he means to a lot of us, even though he's wearing this, this raider uh, sweater, Lord. We lift him up before you, Lord. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll get you a packer. <laughs> so, yeah, let's continue to keep Carlos and, uh, and his family in prayer during this time. I don't know if any of you guys have ever lost a parent. It's rough. Also want to lift up John Gonzalez. Uh, John had a heart attack 
a week ago yesterday, and he's already out of the hospital. So praise God for that. Uh, and so, and also uh, Oscar Fedia's uh, sister, Carmen, as she's going to start chemo. Uh, let's keep her in prayer. And then men will have our men's conference tickets uh, for sale after our service today. It's good to see Brother Joe with us. God bless you, brother. Uh, and then uh, those who are involved with Lion Tamers, Iron Sharpens Iron, uh, Prison Ministry. I hope you guys aren't involved in Anchored because that's a, for women only, but... <laughs> If you guys happen to go there, that's between you and the Lord, right? Uh, but we're having a night of worship this Friday night, and we have guest artist uh, Richard Andrew is going to be leading the worship, going to have a time of communion, uh, a Bible study. And so if you guys are any in part of any of those ministries, where's it going to be at? It's going to be in the mini chapel. In the mini chapel. And so uh, bring, your wives. bring your wives. Yeah. And so invite you guys to come on out. A reminder, as you guys already see that, there are some offerings on the offering table already. It's up here weekly. Feel free to bring your <laughs> gifts. Also, somebody left this Bible here. This belong to anybody? It looks brand new, so whoever is going to come get it afterwards because we will clown you because it looks new. <laughs> Nobody? If it's yours, come see me afterwards. <laughs> we'll sell it back to you for 10 bucks. Okay, uh, let's get into prayer and then we'll get into our word. We're in 2 Kings uh, and we're going to do a little bit of recap, but... We're going to pick up in 2 Kings chapter 1 was verse 13, but I want to just recap a little bit of things, but let's open in prayer. Father, you've heard our prayers this morning, Lord. We lift up the entire Marquez family. We lift up John Gonzalez, Lord. We lift up Carmen, Lord. We lift up our study. And Lord, we thank you for the men that are here, those who are watching online. Lord, may your word go forth that our hearts will be open to receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to do is just uh, recap. I want to go back to verse 9 because it helps us to get an understanding of where we're picking up at. So in first, uh, Second Kings cha uh, chapter 1, beginning with verse 9, it says, Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his, with, uh, captain of, of 50 with his 50 men. And so he went up to him, and there he was sitting on top of a hill. We're talking about Elijah. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. So Elijah, an so Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Then he sent him, then, and this is King Azahiah, King Azahiah, then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, man of God, this has, thus has the king said, come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said to them, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him, consumed him and his 50. And again, he sent a third captain of 50. You know, as I shared last week a little bit, guys, is there was a time in my life where I had brought shame and reproach to my mom and dad, by the way I was living my life, the style I was living, yet I had grown up in the church. And a lot of you probably can relate to this. I'd grown up in the church, yet I, I had this, I took this attitude of taking God's grace for granted. John 3.16 was just something I memorized to get Sunday school points, but never realized the impact of that powerful verse. I live for the world, and, and, and yet I threw a little bit of Christianity here and a little bit of Christianity there, and, and I would call myself a Christian. My life was not a life that was set apart for the Lord. Rather, it was set apart from the world, yet it was woven together with this Christianity that I self-invented. My life was not lived. It was, it was, it was lived for the world again, but yet... I would weave Christianity into the, the world ways of living. I thought it was still cool to, to drink a beer here and there. I thought it was still cool to use here and there. I thought it was still cool to watch pornography here and there. I, I thought it was cool because I knew that God would forgive me. So I was taking his grace for granted. And yet I was trying to live this Christian life where I would refer to myself as, as this Christian. And yet 
throughout the whole life, my, my life was splattered with ways of the world. I, I, wasn't been, I, I couldn't be distinguished as a man of God or of a man of the world because it was so intertwined. And these two worlds that are tried to be mixed together will never mix. I brought dishonor not only to my parents, but I brought dishonor to the Lord. And there's no way that we can interweave our lives as a Christian living a life of holiness and try to fulfill the ways of the world in our lives. It doesn't work. And eventually one of these will give in to the other. And it's usually the way of the world because that's what our flesh desires. And this is what we see in our passage here today, men. We see that Azahiah had fell through a lattice and he was injured. And he sends messengers to Baal, actually Baal Zebub, to inquire if he was going to survive. And on the way to this, on the way of the messengers, as they were going from Samaria to Ekron, they come, in, they come across Elijah, where the Lord had told them, the Lord had told him, go tell these messengers that because there's no God in Israel, that you're inquiring of a false God, go back and tell your king that he will surely die. And so, again, we, we talked about this last week, men, is that these guys went back to the king, the king that sent them on a message. On, he told them, go do this. Now, remember with me, in Middle Eastern kings didn't mess around. If you're instructed to do something, you're going to do it. But the fact that they turned around and heard from some guy, they don't even know who he is, and, and went against what the king told them to do, that usually meant execution. And so these guys turned around after seeing this guy in camel hair, probably looked crazy, whacked out beard. You know, I, we don't know what he looked like. But there was something about Elijah that these men would turn away from the king's command to go inquire of Baalzebub and they turn back and they go back to the king with this message from Elijah that he's going to die. How do they recognize, first of all, why would they even turn around? I mean, if the king sent me out on a message, I'm going to make sure it's fulfilled because I know what the consequences would be. But what was it about Elijah that was so apparent that he was able to, these men went against the king's wishes and went back to the king with this bad news. We talked about this last week, men. Are we recognized as a man of God? Are we recognized as a man of God by the way we speak, by the way we live our lives? Are we recognized by the, as, a man of, as a man of God by our mannerism or how we respond to crisis? How do we respond to different things? How do we respond to tough times in our relationships or tough times at the job or tough times even here at church? How do we respond to that? Because this is what will tell the world who we live for. And, and remember with me, as, as Azahiah is facing crisis, he's now turned to Baalzebub for an answer. Remember, what we turn to in a time of crisis is what we worship. So who, who do we turn to or what do we turn to during difficult times? Do we turn to our friends? Do we turn to our wives? Great counsel, nothing wrong with turning to friends and wives. But who do we usually turn to first will determine what we worship. And so in verse 9 to 10, we see that, or nine, verse 9, that the king now is sending for Elijah because these messengers go back and they tell the messengers from the word of God, tell King Ezahiah, <laughs> we ran into this guy, he looked kind of crazy, he was hairy, and he was recognized as, by King Ezahiah. Elijah the Tishbite. He was recognized as a man of God. And so they bring this word back to Azahiah that you will surely die. And now Azahiah sends captains of 50 to go and bring Elijah back. Now, some commentators debate on why he was bringing them back. 
Some say that he was bringing them back to see if he can convince them and giving him another word from the Lord. Some commentators point out that he is actually bringing him so he can arrest him and throw him in jail and, uh, and, and be harsh to him because of the news he brought. But it doesn't tell us directly, but by the way they had said, come down as a command, is usually not a suggested thing. I don't know if any of you guys around here have any encountered with law enforcement. And they tell you, put your hands up. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Because if not, you're going to get tased. And so this is kind of the same thing. Come down here. It's not, oh, just come down, Elijah. No, come down here. How come when I mention cops, some of you guys started squ squirreling in your seats a little bit? So you guys getting a little nervous around here. Yeah. But he brings this report to him and he sends out 50 men to Elijah. Elijah's sitting on a hill and, and, and he sees him and, they, and this captain of 50 men. Now a captain, who was it that told me last week about military? Who was it that said, talk to me about a captain? See, you can send your messengers out like King Azahiah did, but when you send a captain out, it better be fulfilled because now you're up there in rank and the captain's job from the king is taken very seriously and he's commanded to go and bring back Elijah. And so what happens is Elijah says, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. Boom, and I joked last week, this is where chicharrones were invented, right? <laughs> These guys were smoked. So as a high sends another 50, a captain of 50. If I was that second captain, I'd be like, wait a minute, man. There's no way I'm going to go out there. But a man of, under orders, right? He goes out and he says, man of God, come down quickly. Changes it a little bit. And he says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. Boom. Comes down and consumes him. And so what was wrong with all of this, guys? Why was this judgment brought in with these captains of 50? Kind of the same thing that I introduced the study with. Sometimes we can live a life that is supposed to be set up for the Lord, but instead... We have ways of the world involved, such as this. Think of this for a moment, you guys. These captains of the king, Jewish, they were steeped into the five books of the Torah since they were kids. They know who the God of Israel is. He is a Israeli king. They know their Old Testament. They would know what God did for them in, in, in the book of Exodus. They would know that what God did with them in, in all the Old Testament, they were raised this way. And now they are serving a king that is worshiping a false god. And I think about as I gave you guys this introduction this morning, is how I lived a life that was woven with Christianity and it was woven with the world and the two don't mix. And I think sometimes we think we can get away with that. We think that we can live a life that, is, that, is full, that has little remnants or, or things of the world and think that we can still call ourselves Christians. And judgment was brought to these men because they were under the order of a king that was worshiping a false god that was coming and questioning God's authority. And when we live our lives like that, men, we are doing the same thing. You know, uh, uh, at one time, there was a time where when I was, and I shared this with you guys, when I was getting clean, that I, I, I still was hanging on to secret sin. Tim, I just seen that you're logged on. I, 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 I would have these secret sins that I would kind of just, these are mine. Lord, you can have everything in this world. You can have my heart. You can have this. But you, this little area in my heart, you can't have because that's my kind of my go-to. And I don't know how transparent I'm going to be here. I hope only men are watching this. Because, men, my obedience to the Lord wasn't sold out. My obedience 
to the Lord was actually disobedient because you're either obedient or you're, or you're not. There's no half-stepping obedience. And in my life, I was, I, I, I had been, I would come to church and yet because I had these little secret sins in my life, which not little, I wanted to have these things as my go-to, kind of these things I would tuck away and when it was good for me, I would do these things. And it usually went in a cycle like this, man. Oh, I've been doing good. I've been doing great, Lord. I deserve this. And this would usually be a drink. And from the drinking, it would go, oh, you know, this is kind of cool. I deserve this. I, I miss this. I, and notice all the eyes that I'm using in my heart. Because when we start using eyes in our hearts, we are disobedient to the Lord because a surrendered heart is like, Lord, you direct me, you lead me, you show me. Instead, I was using, I deserve this, I need this, I want this. And the drinking would lead to using. It's weird, you guys. I, I, I wouldn't remember the connections number for years. And all of a sudden, I, rem I remember what, it's, what, what the number is. And I would shoot him a text. And, and weird that he would respond and say, hey, come on over. And the next thing I know, I'm back into using. Back strung out. And then the user would lead me to pornography. And, and you know what happens from there these little secret things that I thought I could hang on to was what destroyed my life. And we cannot interweave the world with a life of holiness. We can't try. It doesn't mix. And we see here that this captain, these captains who got God's judgment on them should have resisted the ungodly and unmoral command from the king to bring Elijah. That means that they're standing for what the king stands for. Idol worshiping. They should have refused to obey the king and sought the Lord. And see, this is what the obedient, having obedience in the Lord to God's word is so important, men. Because what has crept into the church today has been this pseudo-obedience. And I mentioned this last week. Because I wear a cross around my neck, I'm a Christian. Or because I have Calvary Chapel Chino Valley sticker on my bumper, on my car, I'm a Christian. Even that, it may say, not of this world. It means I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. But when it comes to surrendering and it comes to living a life under the authority of God's word, don't judge me, brother. Don't judge me. When it comes to having a surrendered life to Christ, there are too many rules. I can't do that. You know, following Jesus, I can't have fun. Those are excuses of a life that is living in disobedience. But they go on confessing that they're Christians and they continue to live in ungodly and immoral ways. So we see here, in, as, a, as a reminder in verse 9, it says, come down. And he tells him, if I'm a man of God in verse 10, then let fire come down and consume you. See, God's judgment to disobedience men is serious. And if we think we can walk with one world in disobedience, one foot in the world in disobedience, and think we can walk with one world in Christianity, just a matter of time before God's judgment will fall on you. And he sent fire from heaven. You know what? The only way that fire comes from heaven is from God. So we see here, we don't see Elijah saying, yeah, I'm a man of God. Look at me. Give me the red carpet, carpet treatment. Give me this. Give me that. And so we see here that as Azahiah disregarded the tragedy of his first captain being consumed by fire, he sends another captain of 50 and he's consumed with fire. And this is where we pick up in verse 13. And again, 
he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to him, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants be, of yours be precious in your sight. Wow, what a stark contrast of responses. This is interesting. Even though Azahiah's heart is hardened, he still sent, and he sends a third captain. That's 150 men so far. A hundred of them have been consumed with fire by God's judgment. And here we see a captain who was under king's orders who must recognize who the God of Israel is. Because he comes with reverence and respect and he begins to plead. What's interesting here, when we look at this, it says that this guy, it says, uh, he came and fell on his knees before him. Now, I thought this was interesting. This, this captain who was under king's order, I mean, he's superior in the ranks of the king's army, comes and, and he surrenders himself to Elijah's authority by falling to his knees. <laughs> He also recognized that Elijah is a man of God and that he acknowledged that fire, that the fire had fallen, had come from heaven, that it was caused by God. And, and the third, a captain approaches this mission in a completely different manner. He doesn't come saying, come down here or what he does here. Is, and, and I thought this was amazing because we see here, I mean, maybe the third captain walked up there and seen these black spots on the, on the ground, right? bones just laying there and he's like sizzling i mean i don't know but his approach is different and when i was looking at this a little closer this is a model of how we approach the lord right this is a model of worship god he is a prophet of god he was recognized as a man of god he was a, a representation of god and so the this this captain came and he worshiped the lord through the office of this prophet. Because we see here, right away he comes and he, he falls on his knees before Elijah and he pleaded with him and said, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Verse 14, look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50 with 50s, but let my life now be precious in your sight. Isn't it amazing also that's kind of a format of a prayer? We bring our worship to the Lord. We plead with him. We recognize who he is and we acknowledge that our lives are in his hand. And then we can acknowledge the works that he has done around us. And then we ask for grace and mercy in our lives. This is a, mod a beautiful model of prayer. This is a beautiful model of how we are to approach the Lord. I think there has been a casualness of approaching God. One thing I think we, we forget men, not so much with us men here, but one thing that I think is forgotten today is the fear and reverence for the Lord. Because we see this man approach Elijah, who's a representation of God with fear and reverence. And we know that a good indicator of all this loss for reverence for parents is looking at how our children are today or how children are today. Disrespectful. Even more so now when I was a kid. I mean, think about some of you older guys that were here who come from old school parents. And think about some of the things that the way kids are today, there's this loss of respect for parents. And that's just a, a sample size of our world today that there has been a loss for the fear and reverence of the Lord. We live in a time where it's disrespectful. We live in a disrespectful time when there's no respect for anything. And we can see that in the way that Christians can live out their lives. But here we see that the captain has a reverence and respect of Elijah. There's also been a loss of reverence for God's word. You know, I think about this even in my own life. When I'm trying to, not so much me, but I just think about like in my life that 
When has there been a time when I've lost reverence for God's word? Well, it came when I was seeking my own will, seeking to do things my way. And today, the power of the word of the power of the word of God is even just as powerful as it always been. But we as people have given it up to ideologies and philosophies, new age movement, postmodernism. All these different Scientology or these scientific approaches has been trying to take away the power of the Lord. But we know that God's power, word is powerful, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword, right? God's word is still powerful. But yet there can be a tendency in our lives to replace these God's words and God's promises with other things. But these are the things that bring dishonor to the Lord. And these are exactly what these other two captains have done. They brought dishonor to the Lord and they were disobedient. And judgment fell upon them. And we see here in verses 13 and 14 again as, a, as kind of a cool model of prayer. Of we're to approach the Lord with fear and reverence. I think we can have this casual approach to the Lord. Like... You know, I picture somebody chewing their gum. Well, you know, Lord, I'm going to use you as a genie. I'm going to rub you through. I'm going to rub the lamp three times, Lord, and you're going to, you're going to do as I command. Lord, I want you to. Sounds like these captains. Lord, come down and listen to my prayer. Don't you know I'm praying? Don't you know I'm the, the one that means the most in this whole entire universe? So you need to listen to me. We can have that approach when it comes to God. We can have approach as these two captains did. Come down quickly. And the Lord's like, who are you? But we have that approach a lot of times, men, when it comes to God. And, and instead of bringing our request to him and our supplications and our adoration and worship to him, we make these commands on God. Lord, you're going to do this for me. And then when it doesn't work out, what do we say? Oh, Christianity, see, God doesn't answer prayer Blah, 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 blah. We hear that. What happened to the fear and reverence and respect from the Lord? Just in a practical level, you guys, if I ever came to my dad that way, my teeth would still be missing. <laughs> I would never speak to my dad that way. Why would we think we can make demands on the Lord like that? And we see here in verse 15 is, and, and we see the, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord now and comes down and makes an, another appearance to Elijah. And he tells him here in verse 15, uh, go down with him, with this captain, and do not be afraid of Azahiah. So he arose and went down with him to the king. Now there was some, I had mentioned Azahiah, some commentators think that it could have been, he could have been fearful of the captain because of his position or the Lord saying, don't be fearful of Azahiah. So there's two different thoughts there. But he arose and he went down with him to the king. Now notice the obedience of Elijah. Again, he didn't ask for a second opinion. He didn't ask for anything. But the Lord said, the angel of the Lord, the Christophany here, right? Comes and tells him, Arise and go with him. And it says, Elijah got up and he went. So he arose and went down. There's obedience right there. See, do you see what the writer's doing here? He's showing you what disobedience looks like and the result of it and what obedience looks like and the result of this, God's word. And we see the writers here pointing those two things out so that we get clear contrast of our obedience to the Lord and reverence to the Lord is of utmost importance in our lives. But disobedience and following things of the world and following the Baals and following the pursuits of our own things will lead to God's judgment. And this is what the writer's pointing out here. He's pointing out that there were messengers sent from the king and then the angel of the Lord was sent by God. And now here again, the angel of the Lord comes and he tells Elijah, go with him. Don't be afraid. Go in front of the king. And so we see that this was the sixth time that Elijah has been instructed by God to leave. And it's the sixth time that Elijah responded in obedience. 
Because out of those six times, if Elijah only responded four times, that's disobedience. Six times from 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 21, 2 Kings chapter 1, there are six commands that God has given Elijah to rise up and go, and all six times Elijah went up and rose. Uh, two times of those, three times are those were to face a king, an angry king who didn't like him. Men, what's our track record with obedience? Our obedience to God's word. Our obedience to live a holy and set apart life. Because this is what our families need. This is what our, our children need. This is what our job sites need. They need men of God that can be recognized as men of God. The whole incidents, the whole incident like the contest on Mark, Mount Carmel was designed to demonstrate God's sovereignty to the king and to the people of Israel. And so when we look at verse 15, as he arose and went down to the king, we see that that. God instructs Elijah to go down, to go down with this captain to the king. God assured Elijah that he wouldn't have to fear him. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. See that promise right there? is a promise when we live in obedience. But do you see the promises of those who are disobedient? They got consumed with fire. Now, I'm not saying if you guys are disobedient, you're gonna go out there. and If I see a black spot out there, I'm gonna know one of you guys are disobedient. <laughs> Probably be Gabe. <laughs> It'll be me, Gabe. <laughs> I love Gabe, I just, he's a good brother. But you see the, the, the fruit of obedience, where God says, I will be with you. I will, don't, don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous, right, and powerful hand. That is the result of a life in obedience. God's promises such as these. And so, men, a life of obedience. So we see in verse 16 that, now that they, uh, they said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire about Azabub, the God of Ekron, it is because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Now Elijah is in front of the king and gives him this message. Standing before the king, Elijah fearlessly delivered the message that God has given to him. Because of Azariah's failure to consult of the God of Israel and his determination led to an independently to seek a false God and God will dispose of him. Two things here, men. In, when we're in obedience to God's word and living a life that is set apart from him, we can stand before anyone and anything. Amen. When we're walking in the ways that please the Lord, the Bible says, even my enemies will be at peace with me. We may, be, we may be facing huge giants today, men. We may be fused, uh, facing difficult times today, men. The way that we're going to go through this is obedience to God's word. Because we see that Elijah is standing now before the king. Now remember, the king's the most powerful king besides Ben-Hadad in that area and probably the kings of Assyria. This is one of the most powerful kings in the Middle East. And he would be quick to execute you if you didn't tell him what he wanted to hear. Yet, in obedience to God's word, Elijah is able to stand before him and say, yeah, you're surely going to die. Could we really do the same thing, men? Can we really do the same thing? And we see that this is the same message that God had given the messengers, I mean, that Elijah gave him the messengers when Elijah found the messengers going to Ekron. God's word doesn't change. 
God's word is the same. The same message he gave the messengers is the same message that he gave the king. Tells us one thing, men, that God's word is faithful. God's word does not change. And so we see in verse 17 that, so according to God's word, so Azahiah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Because he had no son, Jero, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the king of Jehosh, Jehosh, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now, the rest of the acts of Azahiah, which he did, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Azahiah dies as promised, right? The proof was in the result. Elijah was demonstrated to be a man of God because his prophecy was spoken just as fulfilled. Remember with me when that when that one guy, I'm trying to remember his name, um, Zedidiah, was that his name? Remember he was the, Zedekiah. Remember Zedekiah said he was a true prophet of the Lord and that he even made horns, uh, a steel of, of bronze and said that Syria will be gorged. Usually prophets will act something out. And if the word came true, we know that as a true man of God. We know that didn't happen. But because Elijah was a man of God, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this captain that came and pleaded with him. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it does tell us that God's word is true. God's word is faithful. And what the writer is doing here, again, guys, is contrasting the word of the king versus God's word. What do we choose today, men? Do we hear... Are we here to, uh, do we choose to listen to the ways of the world? Or do we choose to hear the word of the Lord? Because it's going to determine, men, and how you're spending time in God's word. So how are you guys doing in spending time in God's word? Hopefully it's every day. One commentator points this out. Uh, as we know that Azahiah did not recover from his fall, he died. One commentator points out everything he did was weak, faithless, miserable. He achieved nothing but ruin and failure. He let Moab rebel. He hurt himself in a clumsy accident. He foolishly attempted to use military force against Elijah. And worse, he sought help in the wrong places, in Felicia, at the altar of a pagan god. And it tells us, because in verse 17, because he had no son, Jeroham became king, which we'll see in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. It was Ezahiah's brother. Ezahiah had no descendants to pass on the kingdom, so the throne went to his brother for a brief reign of Ezahiah. It gets a little confusing here because we see that his brother, Ezahiah's brother, is named Jeroham. So is the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, is also Joram. So it becomes a little confusing. But besides this, men, what is the overarching, overarching messages that are here? There's two of them that I want to drive home with you guys. First of all, obedience to the Lord is key. There's no half obedience. There's no, I'm going to, I'm going to be obedient here. I'm going to do it here as I feel obedience has nothing to do with feelings, men. Are you obedient? Or are there ways of the world that are woven into our obedience to the Lord that makes us disobedient? Are we obedient to God's word? Do we have a surrendered heart to our Savior? And the second overarching message I want to drive here is men, how do we represent being a man of God? Because we can deny the sovereign power of God and go off looking for Baal in the name of Christianity. We want to dance with the devil rather than walk with God. If we're truly with walking with God, why would we want to consult anywhere else? This is what we see here with these men that got scorched. To know God's will is to do what King Jehoshaphat did in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 5, 
Seek the counsel of the Lord. We're to read our Bible and pray for wisdom of the Holy Spirit, but we're not to send out for Baalzebub. When we are in obedience to the Lord, submitting to his word, and live in a life that is directed by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not need to consult with any other things, but rather we would consult and inquire of the ways of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23 says, But this is what I command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and I will walk in the ways that I have commanded you, that, you, that it may be well with you. Men, may we be men of obedience. May we be men that are surrendered and set apart for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we be men of God's word. And most of all, men, may we be recognized as men of God, especially in a day to day when the enemy is trying to pull away the importance of the man in not only our families and our marriages, but with our children. May we be encouraged to spend more time in God's word. May we be encouraged to spend more time in prayer. May we be encouraged to live a life that is set apart for our King Jesus. To get, away, get rid of those things that may be worldly in our lives. Because ultimately, because our heart is wicked and above all things deceitful, it will eventually grab to that life of the flesh. Men, this is the time and the day, especially in these last days, men, to be men of obedience. And this is what we need to stand on. Stand on God's <laughs> word. Amen? Amen? So let's pray, and then we'll have some amazing papas and chorizo burritos, bro. Manna from heaven. Thank you, Jesus. So <laughs> let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the men that are here this morning, Lord. Lord, may we be men set apart for your, for your word. Men that will not stand for the things of the world, Lord, especially in these last days, Lord. We're living in these last days. Pestilence is going crazy everywhere, Lord. It just, it just the days are dark. And what this world needs are men of God. So, Lord, may we be men of your word, men of obedience, men that are set apart to live a life of holiness for you. Lord, men that are recognizable as men of God. I thank you for these men here and the families that are represented here, Lord. Thank you for the brothers that are online joining us and those who will watch later on. Lord, may we be encouraged by your word this morning. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Oh, Andy is going to be in the back selling men's conference steak. Oh, actually, he's going to be over there where Bobby's at. If you guys want to buy me a steak breakfast, skip, I'm eating light now, you guys. So give me like three or four of them and uh, we'll be good. Well, Andy's there for men's conference tickets. God bless you guys.